Welcome. I can only conclude that Tony Heller can't read graphs. Either that, or he's deliberately misinterpreting graphs. Well, let's see what you think. Recently, Heller, or is it Stephen Goddard? I really can't trust anybody that uses two different names. Put out a YouTube video uh, entitled Climate Fakery Part 19. In it, he claims that he's going to show how NASA and NOAA turn a measured long-term cooling trend in the US to a warming trend. The only problem is he fails to do so. In the video, Heller states that the US has the most comprehensive, long-term and accurate weather network in the world. And he shows a plot something like this, which shows the 1200 US climate reference network stations. Now this is an excuse to use just the US data. And despite the fact that it represents only 1.6% of the planet in area, there's just 1200 stations here. They are unevenly distributed and he uses the raw data from them, which is a problem and I'll get back to that in a minute. The most comprehensive network of stations, really? This is a map of the weather stations distributed around the world. And I would argue that Europe has a far more dense and comprehensive measurement system than the US does. I'll remind Heller that the UK has temperature measurements going back to 1750, whereas the US starts its temperature record at 1880. And I'm sure the Europeans would take great umbrage at the fact that the US is claiming greater accuracy when it was the Europeans that invented the thermometer long before the US actually existed. Heller seems to like to use raw data, but raw data is useless for data interpretation. Let me explain why. Let's just take a single station to start with. The same station. Over the period of time, the equipment will change. It will age and be replaced. And each time you have a new calibration. Sometimes even the location of the station has changed. Often the surroundings of the station will be changed. The houses will be built up around it or it will be moved. Then there's human error. Many of the older stations used meteorologists to go out and measure the temperature at the weather station. They would often choose different times of day. They can read the wrong number. They can write down the wrong number. All equipment has glitches, and you can, so you've got to be able to recognize those glitches. And the sample rate changes. Some stations only measured temperatures once or twice a day, taking the maximum and minimum temperatures. Others now uh, put out data every few minutes. And you've got to allow for that in the analysis. And for a single station, you get a number. But is that number accurate? How do you know? You've got to calibrate it. So you've got to take a calibration reading at those stations from time to time and correct the, the raw data for those calibration changes. The situation gets more complicated when you have multiple stations. You have all the same problems as above, plus you have to now calibrate between instruments, cross calibration. And the area covered by various stations is different, as you saw from that map that I showed earlier. So you have to correct for the area that the station is covering. Stations are different altitudes. Altitude changes the temperature, so you have to correct for that as well. And there are many other correction factors that are not being taken into account when you use raw data. So you're just on a hiding to nothing if you use raw data. Stations are not equally uh, distant from one another, and so you can have some stations in a, a, a hot or a cold area and other stations outside that. Here's an example, simple example. Say you had areas, one of which in the middle here is a hot city, and you have lots and lots of measurement stations in a built up area. So they all register about 20 degrees centigrade on average, but you have 100 measurements doing that. In the surrounding rural areas, which are cooler uh, by 10 degrees, you have much, many fewer stations, say 10 in each one of those boxes. So if you use raw data, you would have 20 times 100 plus 10 times 80. Average over 180 measurements gives you 15.5 degrees centigrade. That's the raw data estimate. If you correct for the areas, 
you have 20 plus 8 times 10 divided by 9, which gives you the average temperature for this uh, overall area of 11.1 .1 degrees centigrade. Now, this becomes much more complicated when the area is covered by each one of the thermometers is different. So you have to correct for that as well, and which again he would call manipulation and I call analysis. If you have multiple stations, they can be at different altitudes and that makes a big difference and you have to correct for that. So what is his proof of this data manipulation? Well, he shows five graphs and points out how different they are, how we've lost the cooling between 1940 and 1980, how they, they've got different shapes, different peaks and things of that sort. What he doesn't point out is if the differences between the plots themselves. For example, this one on the top left is for the Northern Hemisphere. The one on the top right is the US temperature, as is the one on the bottom left. So those in principle are comparable. Then the next one, B, is global temperature, as is the last one is global temperature. However, that's just a clipping from an old newspaper item. They're also plotted over different time frames, 1880 to 1970, 1880 to 2000, Again, same for the bottom left, and then 1870 to 1970. So that doesn't make a great deal of sense. How can you compare that? Then you look at the y-axis and you see that they're plotted over different ranges as well, which only helps to confuse. A 1.2 degree centigrade range on the left, three degrees centigrade on the right, three on the, on the, the bottom left, and 1.2 in the middle, and 0.5 on the bottom right. These graphs are from different sources. The one on the top left I couldn't find the source for. The one on the top right is NASA. NOAA is the bottom two left ones and NCAR is the bottom right one. Now this means that different groups are analyzing different data in different ways and looking to get the same sort of result. They also average the data in different ways. The top left is an annual average, so that just takes the average for each year. The one on the top right is a bit more complicated. It's a lowest smooth method, and you should probably look that up. But basically what it is, is they take a set of functions and fit it to parts of the curve and then splice those functions together to make the smooth curve. I don't particularly like that method. The bottom left is NOAA, and they use a five-year boxcar smooth method, which is basically you take 60 months worth of data, take the average, move up one month, take a new average, and so on. That smooths out the data quite nicely. And then the one on the right is a five-year average, so you just take five years worth of data, take the average, then move up five years and take another average. They're also using different baselines, and I don't particularly like this. Uh, climatologists use the last 30 years as the baseline for their and temperature anomaly plots. So each one of these would have been done on with a different baseline. And I show what those baselines likely are here. Now this makes a very big difference to the absolute value of the uh, relative temperature anomaly, but it doesn't make a difference to the slope of the anomaly. So if you're looking for a trend, this makes no difference whatsoever. It just makes a difference on what the scale on the left of the plot looks like. Now this is what difference changing the baseline does. Uh, these are baselines shown for 30 year periods from 1951 to the current period. And you can see each baseline is slightly different and they're increasing. So as you go by, if you're taking the data from the 1930s, for example, and comparing it on the 1991 to 2020 baseline, it will knock off 0.6 of a degree centigrade for that older data. And so it will make the older data appear cooler. However, as I said, it doesn't change the trend at all. You will notice that this, there, the zero here is the 20th century average. And I wish the climatologists would just use the 20th century average, which is a constant. And then you don't need to worry about this changing baseline problem. Now, Heller sometimes uses this to prove that the older data has been made to look colder. Of course, it does look colder, but it doesn't change the trend, which is the thing he forgets to mention. You will notice that the steps in each one of these baselines is getting larger. This shows that the globe is in fact warming. Let me compare the lengths of those uh, arrows uh, over here on the left. and You can see each one is taller than the previous one. 
Interestingly enough, if you take the baseline for the first three years of the 2020s, you get this. And so if anyone believes there's a cooling trend in this data, they are out of their minds. One thing Heller does is continuously complain about the fact that these data analyses have removed the cooling trend from 1940 to 1975. That's this period here. Now you'll notice that the total extent of the cooling trend here is about 0.4 degrees centigrade, so it's not very big to start with. In his video, he claims that the cooling trend has disappeared from the data set. So here are the five curves again, and you can draw in the uh, cooling trend and fit a line to them. And they are all rather similar, 0 0.5 degrees centigrade, 0 0.4, 0 0.5, 0 0.3, 0.3. So th those cooling trends didn't disappear at all. They've just been plotted on a different scale curve. And so you don't see them quite so clearly, but they are still there. Another thing he relies on is saying that all these graphs look so different. Are they really that different? Let me take the NASA 2019 US temperatures compared with the NOAA uh, temperatures for a similar period. I'm going to trace out the curve from the NASA plot and transfer it over to the NOAA plot. And you can see they are quite similar, despite the fact of the difference in the way that the data was analyzed, what data was used, and who did the analysis. Within 0.1 degrees centigrade, those two curves are identical. But he's showing plots going up to the year 1999. Why? Why has he omitted all the data from uh, 1999 to 2023? Well, let's take a look at that data. This is the complete set of data. And you can see the data from uh, 1999 onwards shows a large number of very high values. So this sort of kills his idea of a cooling trend completely. In fact, this is the things that he has omitted here in the blue square. And so consequently, he's taken out some of the hottest years on record. It also puts a lie to his uh, claim, which he uses again and again and again, that the 1930s were the hottest years on record. They weren't. Um, that was surpassed in 1998 and many years after uh, that, they've been surpassed again and again and again. So, uh, and I think this year will be no exception. So 1930s were not the hottest, even just limited to the United States. So let's summarize all of this. He showed us five graphs. I pointed out 30 differences between those graphs. This is designed to confuse you. Heller is relying on the fact that you won't check, like I have just done, uh, what he says and just believe what he says. What he says is nonsense. So I can only conclude that Tony Eller does not know how to read graphs or he's deliberately misinterpreting those graphs to try to make a point. I'll, I'll let that you decide which of those two is the case, but you should remember that he's been told this many, many times before and he's ignored it every time. So thank you for watching. Until next time, stay safe and goodbye.